So um, as I promised you, the first three speakers were powerhouses, uh, visionaries, futurists, and they gave us uh, the big picture of open education, and they gave us a lot of mixed metaphors for how to conceptualize what open education is. It's definitely an ecology. Um, Rich has his favorite examples, which surprisingly are all about physics and artificial intelligence and stuff that has not much to do with foreign languages. So we wanted to shift things a little bit in the afternoon and start talking about how this applies to foreign languages. Um, our sessions then today will be we'll do a quick, a very quick review of three projects from CORAL, three foreign language projects that implement open in different ways, open access or open textbooks as we've heard, open source uh, software, and then our third presentation uh, is, uh, I just learned a new buzzword from Rich and that's about, what was it even, I get in, in reach. Right, we, we were doing in-reach and we didn't even know it. We've been doing outreach, but the idea is to create a community, a heterogeneous community of different kinds of people creating content together. So that's it in a nutshell. So uh, let me start by introducing Karen Kelton. There are four of us representing Coral, Karen, Rachel, Natalie, okay? And Karen's gonna talk to you about our open, open textbooks, Français Interactif and Deutsche Blick. Yoruba. Oh, and Yoruba. Hold on. Sorry. And Yoruba and, Yemi. Yes. Um, so I'd like to start by inviting you to take a textbook. We had some extra FIPSI grant money. So we have textbooks uh, for as many as you can carry back with you. Please, we will put them out on the, t uh, on the table. So we've got Yoruba, Deutsche Blick, and Français Interactif. So please help yourselves, take one for your colleagues. Um, we encourage you. Uh, and again, we benefit from feedback. Français Interactif is in its third edition, and we are still finding typos. We are still finding things that need to be changed. Uh, not as many as we used to, but there. Anyway, that, that's the, the outsourcing is, is very valuable. So um, I wanted to start with, with Yoruba. We have the, um, the author, Tola Mosadomi, in, in the audience, and she is featured in our newsletter, too. So uh, take a look at that. One of the, um, the things that we're most excited about this is the use of QR codes within the textbook. So um, if you, all of the audio, this is a black and white textbook. There are no, there's no color. These came from Word documents that uh, Natalie formatted. It's just beautiful with line drawings. And if you, if you look on page 27, you see a, um, a dialogue. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna illustrate the QR code, but I did this yesterday. So listen. Yeah. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Every student has one of these. QR codes, this is so high tech, it's on your tablet. So this is a QR code in the right hand corner, upper right hand corner. It automatically downloads content then to an iPhone or a smartphone or, right. Audio or video. And it, it really works. Um, if you'd like a, de a demonstration, let me know. I've got my iPod. This book, how much do you think it costs? George. They're putting oh. QR codes on tombstones. Oh, I don't know. We haven't oh. done that yet. Oh, la la. Okay, so this is a textbook of Yoruba. It's a less commonly taught language. How much do you think this costs? One dollar. $22.80. And that, that's with a $4. Uh, royalty fee that comes back to coral. So these are affordable and they are they are good. Okay? Our 
This was published in May, so it's first been being used um, this, this fall. The, uh, the German program, Deutsche Blick, was just um, hot off the press in August, just in time for students to order in September. So this is a first edition, and we're still working with it. You can see it's much thicker. How, how much do you think this is? This is a complete first year program. $216. Right. <laughs> I have to check. $31.02. And, and that does include, we upped the royalties on the German and the French so that we could get some money back. $10. That includes a $10 royalty fee per book. So, $10 per book. It comes directly back to Coral, and we can use it for anything we want, including food, by the way. <laughs> So if we, uh, what do these open textbooks look like? This, um, the German is much thicker than the French, and I'll show you why um, in a moment. <laughs> uh, Gabby, no, no, no. <laughs> so the Deutsche Blick, if we go to chapter two, you can see um, it does have the QR codes too uh, within it. You can see at the end, there's a whole bunch of QR codes, so it acts as accesses all of the media. But this German program um, piggybacks on our, the UT Study Abroad program in Würzburg. So we, the um, author, Zsuzsanna um, Abrams, did a lot of filming in Germany at Würzburg, and her students act as virtual guides. Now, Carl's done a lot of research on the use of non-native speakers and uh, teaching identity, the, the, the way this motivates our students. They get a virtual trip to, to Germany or to France. So here, it, could we play? We have videos of both native speakers and non-native speakers. If you look at chapter two, um, das Studium, okay. pardon my German, meine Studium, okay. Eva, Eva. Okay. Eva. Ich studiere Englisch und Geografie auf Lehramt Gymnasium. Mhm. Wo studierst du? Ich studiere in Würzburg, einem kleinen Örtchen, relativ klein. Mhm. Okay, so you get the, the, the idea. That's our native speaker. Now we have the same with one of our non-native speakers, Sarah. Uh, yeah. Was studierst du? Ich studiere Geografie, das ist mein Hauptfach, und ich studiere auch Deutsch und Französisch als Fremdsprachen. Warum studierst du Fremdsprachen? Uh, ich liebe Fremdsprachen. Okay. Not only do they, are they interviewed, but they also give tours of their houses. So we, here we see uh, Sarah's uh, kitchen. You see okay. down under the Schrocken context. Sarah's kitchen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So she's going to give the students a tour. She's living in Würzburg um, for the summer. Yeah. For the summer. So this is her tour. So now we are in my kitchen, and we have a Tisch and four stools and glasses. This is chapter two. So basically, still, it's just lists and vocabulary. But that gives you an idea uh, of what this includes. Um, all of the media has. Uh, have activities in the textbook, but not only there, do they have media uh, activities for the for the activities, there is also grammar, vocabulary, um, web quests, and let's, here's a, a, a web quest. So again, the idea of authentic documents, this came up earlier. The way to keep authentic documents authentic is to put them on the web, not in the textbook because we can still, we can keep those up to date. Um, the grammar is done with a, a pedagogical grammar with grim fairy tales. So we have links into, let's, uh, here are the days of the week with audio. Die Tage der Woche. Montag, die et cetera, et cetera. And it's peopled by uh, grim fairy tale characters. 
So this is a first, uh, first edition, the first edition that we're sending out to everyone. So we expect to be getting a lot of feedback, and it will go, go through um, an iterative process as we test it in the, in the classroom. If we can go on to, uh, uh, to France Interactive. This one you can see is much, <coughs> much thinner. This one is, it costs $29 instead of of $31. Again, we, we've added the, the $10 royalty fee, fee, but the difference between $30 and $200 for a normal text is, is quite, um, quite substantial. One of the reasons that it's much thinner is that we've gone to what Rich Berenick calls his Lego um, theory, building blocks. It's very modular. We took every single activity that dealt with the media an audio or a video, and put those on the web. So the classroom uh, textbook is just classroom activities. And we, we took out a lot of the photos, because photos are, 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 you know, the students are not buying these in, in color. I mean, some of them do. But the ones that aren't, um, the, the photos are, you know, we can pull them up in the classroom and use the, the photos in the classroom. They don't need to be in the textbook. So if we look at chapter three, please. Um, again, you see it's very similar. We don't have the QR codes yet, right, Natalie? But we'll, we will get those sometime. But you can see it's very, very similar. But at the top of every one of those native speakers, you have interview les Français à Austin. Um, if we click on one, just one of those, uh, doesn't matter, le weekend. Franck, these are our native speakers. And these are Et all. Qu'est-ce que vous faites le weekend? Le weekend? Oui. J'en prof... Je profite uh, du weekend pour faire mes passe-temps favoris. Je... So, the, and then if you click above that in the interviews, les Français, right there, yeah. right on that, up comes a PDF. So, the, basically, we have the workbook on the web in PDF format. So there are no tear out pages. The students print them out and turn them in. And UT is very happy about that they, because we don't, they, we don't have, we don't, we aren't copying anything. The students are doing all the copying. Okay. Um, so, so we also have Activité Internet and, and uh, Chanson. Of course, what do we use but the S SNCF to to have the students take a, a virtual trip to France. And Chanson, we have Ma Louisiane. Okay. <laughs> so, and one of the um, things that we've implemented with Francie Interactive too is this is a Drupal site. So that means for the content developer, I can go in and upload and change PDFs without having to bother Natalie. Okay. Another thing that we've worked on was building a community of teachers. So if we go under teachers, you can see that we have different things, uh, pages explaining the pedagogy. We have some classroom videos of our, uh, our graduate students teaching how they, they teach, uh, and that, that's on that page. But we also have a, Sorry. right there, scripts, scripts uh, under sorry. scripts, going down to scripts. We have various, again, a whole bunch of teacher resources that teachers can uh, access. We have now about 300 uh, teachers who have registered. But if you click down to the bottom, Carl, um, mm -hmm. and let me, right. I'm going to put in my username. Uh, what username? Clicking. Click. It's, it takes two of us to do this. <laughs> that works. We can also upload sample exams. So now if you scroll all the way down, Carl, you'll see sample exams and sample exam videos. So if you click on the very last video at the bottom. This one? Yes. This is the exam video that my Alors, students are going to be doing. On est donc à l'université et on nous a demandé de nous présenter. Alors, pour votre examen. So this is what they're going to be using tomorrow. So we can create these 
little MP4s and for every exam, put them on the web and these are accessible to teachers everywhere um, who, who can use them and who can send us their ideas too. We experimented with a forum. If you click on the forum under teachers, you'll see we ha this is not one of our success yeah. stories. Yeah, sorry. If we can see. Forum teachers, they just want us to give them material. They don't always want to contribute, except for, for Georges Detivo, and, and he will be speaking later this afternoon. George is our Francais Interactive Facebook um, moderator. So we have 300 teachers. Guess how many likes we have on Facebook? Yeah, right. Good guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's, it's been up since uh, May. And George has been working with it. He's, he's been brilliant. But this is a completely different audience. These are not teachers. I mean, we do have a, a handful of teachers. These are independent learners. These are not students in classes. These are people who are just learning French on their own. And they ask, they share. Um, maybe George can spend some time talking uh, about that. Because this is, this is a whole new world. We are going to be starting a Facebook page for German. Um, within the next month, and we hope it will be as successful as this one. Do any of you have any questions at this point? Again, these what? are works in progress, so we're, yeah. One, one qu quick questions, because we have, yeah. I have a quick question, mm -hmm. and that is the, the two of you work time on plus, plus a cast of thousands. A cast of thousands? Okay. Oh, well, hundreds. We use graduate students <laughs> who. What a wonderful segue we're into our next that. We're project. going to answer that question at the yeah right. We're coming. We're going there. Okay. So let let yes, yes another question, question. Esther. Esther. The whole, the, or, or more specifically, to Coral to promote, because as I, I, we were talking about sustainability earlier, so there has to be money in the system somewhere. You need to generate money. Once you launch this, we still need to, need to curate it. Uh, we need to have people who are, act as moderators of this network. Um, we need to pay the server guy, because it, then it becomes maintenance. So yeah, you, you need to have some money to keep it going. So that's where, where the royalties are, are focused right now. So if you're doing, you're not going to get rich if you're going to work with Coral, uh, because these are nonprofit uh, products. Well, nobody gets rich. No, but you really won't get rich, right? Uh, <laughs> I think there's a principle here. They are paid as part of their coral project directors. Uh, we, we, we give them, say, like a summer salary or not even that now with our budget cuts. It's lean times. But yeah, they're paid a small fee. So they're doing this for the common good. That's very much. That. And, and graduate students, we're, we've been experimenting this, um, this fall with uh, contests and award prizes because it's very hard, especially to hire graduate students and know if they're going to produce anything. So we don't pay them until they produce something, and then we give them an award. Aha, uh -huh. yeah, that's good. So let me move on. Uh, David. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Yeah. We talk among ourselves about royalties because one thing we didn't show you um, is our print-on-demand company 
which is coop.com. I think Rich mentioned it. There are many different print-on-demand companies now. This is the one that actually came through the lens of, uh, of, of richbaronick.org. And so um, they use the term royalties, and when it gives us a spreadsheet of how much money is being generated, we, we just think in the, in the terms that they've given us. But you're right, it's not exactly, it's not the same thing as royalties. Okay, let me uh, quickly then talk about our second, see if I can drive and talk at the same time. Mm, I think I'm good, I think I'm good. Okay, so if you wanted, I wanna to talk to you now about open source software, which is another form of openness. These were open access materials. We put them on the web for anybody who has access then to download them. Again, um, they, can, they can use all the materials for free, but we're following a freemium model. There's a premium, they, we, we give stuff for free and then they get hooked and then they may want to buy the textbook. Um, so that, that's an important distinction. Now there's uh, the idea of open source has to do with open source code, sorry. I'm having trouble here. And I wanted to talk really briefly about that an open project for textual annotation. And real briefly, this was started a couple years ago in the Department of English here at UT Austin. And it was the brainchild of Sam Baker, who was a 19th century British literature professor, and his amazing graduate student, Travis, who uh, is a very interesting profile. He's a computational lingu linguist slash British literature specialist slash uh, corpus linguist. He, he can really do it all. Um, very unusual. But they wanted to come up, uh, develop software that would actually help people uh, go through a literary text together and mark it up. So it's just basic markup software, annotation software. Now there are a lot of proprietary softwares that are available, but they cost a lot of money. And the other thing, um, they noticed that, uh, you know, those of us who use word processing systems, sometimes there's a point of diminishing return with software. It gets so powerful and it, ha it has all the bells and whistles, and we only want to use two or three functions. So they, um, they developed what they call e comma, which is, stands for the e commentary machine. And I think one of the things why this works so beautifully is it's so simple. And um, we have done a couple installations here at UT at, at different levels in different foreign language classes, as well as Cornell. We did first year French. Uh, we've also done it uh, in ESL. We've done it with different kinds of readers. For example, we had legal scholars in the law school get online and read a legal draft and then debate each other. So anybody can mark up anything. It's not for literary text. And I, of course, I saw the presentation of Sam's, or the original presentation, and he was talking about, I can't remember if it was Coleridge or whatever the poem was, and I thought we could use that, we could really use that for the foreign language classroom. So last semester, this is an example of a four semester, a four semester French class that I taught using this poem by Eluard, uh, Liberté. And so you see right here, so we have uploaded this text and over here, it gives us a word cloud, right? So it shows us very easily then properties. We can click on it and see properties of the text. So in every stanza, it starts the last line. So the last verse starts with j'écris ton nom, I write your name. So it, the person is writing the name of liberté again and again and again. But there are only two functions here. The blue, here we have tags. So here we've already marked it up. You draw your cursor across part of the text and you write and it pops up uh, a little uh, a window and you write in, so Charlemagne, uh, I had all kinds of people. I had Carla Bruni in my class, I had Nicolas Sarkozy, I had all these famous French people in my class. Um, so, and they tagged, this is repetition, so it's over here. So repetition is one of those. So these are, you can start to look at how different members in the class make these associations, how they tag the poem. Okay, so that's tag clouds. This is an important point in that they're reading each other's readings, they're reading each other's interpretations, and that's the notion of, of kind of this community of readers. Uh, the other function is then to write a commentary, something a little bit longer. So if you wanted to click on this word, abla, and it gives them the pop-up. And I'll just show you a little bit about how this works. Um, they're, they're, they write comments. Okay, and here is Krista who says, 
I want to know whose name. So she has highlighted here, j'écris ton nom, right? That's the refrain, I write your name. I want to know whose name he's writing over and over again. A lover, perhaps? All right, that's the first stanza, so that's not a bad, I mean, that was her first association. And then somebody writes, no, I, I thought the name he was writing was Liberté, as you know, personification. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. And then somebody writes back, no, that's correct. Liberté is the word he's writing everywhere. So the point is, they get into a discussion. Um, we've tried, so this, that's it. They tag and they comment, and this gives them a way to do that. You can do it asynchronously, you can do it synchronously, and we have been, this is now porting this into Drupal. Uh, Kieran just mentioned Drupal, which is an open content management system. So the idea is we could give this to all the institutions. Those of you who have somebody on your campus who knows Drupal, you could have an installation, and you can then play with this. Not only can you just use it right out of the box, but again, the idea is that you can add on to it. And we had, for example, when I gave a demonstration of this last year at Cornell, I had a professor teaching Spanish translation class. And she had in her mind, as she was thinking about this, she wanted lots of different changes to the interface as well as embedding uh, a bilingual dictionary. I said, well, you could do that. And in fact, when we give it to you, you can do that. So that's the idea of open source. So now, uh, come on down. Do you wanna come on down and, and yeah, the, the last, uh, the last project, I think, represents um, a little bit different, this notion of openness. And I'll set it up as they come on down here so they can talk about it. Um, Jacqueline Toribio and uh, Barbara Bullock. Jacqueline is in, in Spanish linguistics and Barbara is in French linguistics. Uh, both of them uh, study bilingualism and multilingualism. And they have a project called Spanish in Texas, and Rich set this up perfectly for us. I don't know whether you remember, but Rich used the word as a um, inreach, outreach and inreach. So my, my, where I think this is really exciting and open is creating an open community of people collaborating around this concept of, and he actually said it himself, building collaborative Spanish language materials. So if we can tap into the community, and they've tapped into it in many different ways. She's, she's gonna drive first. Um, all right, yeah, so we have tapped quite a few people to do this. Um, the idea behind this site is pretty much to let uh, Spanish-speaking Texans speak for themselves. And we envisioned this site as uh, a series of sociolinguistic interviews. Uh, we trained, so we've involved, we, we've, we've in-reached to the university, so the videos that you'll see here were done by our undergraduate students. Um, and they were all Spanish-speaking Texans themselves, and we, trained them, actually Daniel trained them very nicely, to go out in the field and do these interviews. Um, and we basically used, I don't know if Carl spoke about this, we basically used the StoryCorps interview format. And we were lucky enough that StoryCorps has a list of Spanish questions. So the students went to their hometowns and interviewed their friends and families. Everything here has been IRB'd. So everyone that you'll see has um, signed off the talent form and also uh, a research form. Um, they understand they'll be on the web, et cetera. The reason we did that is we also envisioned that this corpus we're developing will be an open research corpus. So this will be, I think, maybe the first time that there's a sociolinguistic corpus that'll be available um, for anybody to use. So we don't have the full videos here yet. Um, Rachel will eventually figure out a great interface for that, but we're still working on it. So we've let our students go and talk to uh, people around. Do you, wanna, um, do you wanna say a little more about the rest of it? You want to? Yeah, go ahead, you talk. Um, <laughs> So we envision this site as um, really engaging the attention of many different types of people, right? So um, from parents to teachers to just regular laypersons who are interested in Spanish in Texas. Um, we think that they would benefit from what we have here, but we're also inviting everyone to contribute. So we've got some information on here that doesn't necessarily relate to the Spanish language, but also to some myths about Spanish speakers in the U.S. and in Texas. All right, so we've got a nice one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll just okay. go ahead. We also, okay, mm -hmm. we also have, and this is what we're inviting, asking people to also contribute to. We have the, what we call the linguistic landscape. Um, these are just images where, people, where Spanish and English are used. Um, you find these all over Texas. The nice thing about this is that it allows teachers to talk about Spanish use and Spanish structure. So for instance, if we go down here, well, wait, go to the next one. 
Um, this is a sign that we took in Walgreen. If you know Spanish, um, this is a really interesting sign because it's just full of mistakes, actually. So no sé, instead of no loitering, no sé means I don't know. So um, anyway, it allowed teachers to, and people to say, what does this sign mean? What can it tell us about the relationship between language and pronunciation, et cetera? So we've already gotten people sending us pictures. So this is, this is good. One way in which people can contribute. Yeah, one way. Okay. okay. Um, but the videos. Okay. okay. So these are the videos. We have a, a brief comment about the types of features that you'll see. And what we like to focus on is the fact that this is normal speech. So we'll say, you know, like all the others, like many other Spanish speakers, these people will use English. Um, we're also focusing on variation. So for instance, Spanish speakers from El Paso don't speak the same as they do in the valley. And so you'll hear different things, like if you hear somebody say mucho, we know if they're out from El Paso. And we point this out in the videos so that people can have their detention directed. Um, go ahead. Um, which one do you like to Whatever one. Okay. Um, Let's do one that code switches okay. so that everybody's not bored. Sure. There you go. Okay, so even those of you who don't speak Spanish will understand about half of this. ¿Cuándo y dónde naciste? Um, el 2 de septiembre 1967 en El Paso, Texas, en un hospital que ya no existe, se llamaba Newark en el segundo barrio, downtown. Pero que anotamos en la escuela que sí se aceptaba, que les daban spankings. Okay. Okay. So, so right now, the full videos are actually being piloted by people who work in bilingual education and teach bilingual teachers. Um, we also are getting a lot of people who work in the valley who teach people at universities where there's 90% Spanish speakers, for instance, bilinguals. So if you go down to uh, Brownsville, Texas, um, in University of Texas at Brownsville, for instance, has like 95% bilingual student population. So they teach these students all the time, and they teach them Spanish because these students don't aren't necessarily literate, right? They speak Spanish, but they're not literate. So most of the time, they're, they're thrown into the basic Spanish program where they actually don't belong. And so um, we're they're going to be cre using these materials to create using these videos to create materials for their students. And in turn, they're going to be sending us the materials. So we're not the materials developers. Um, we're using people who know far more about that than we do. You would not want us to be developing your materials. Um, and so we've got people from all over the University of Texas system working with us, and also from Texas A&M. So that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, so we also have a, um, a graduate student with interest in computational linguistics who will be tagging all of the transcripts. So if you're interested in looking for particular structures, if you're looking for, um, say, the frequency of particular loan words or innovations in the way some of the vocabulary is used, you'll be able to do that as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, again, the point of this was just to show you some concrete examples that weren't about artificial intelligence. Um, and we're trying to implement the ideas that he's talking about, uh, the, 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 our three speakers this morning, about open. All of these are open in different ways, but I think they all have collaboration at the center of them. So they just mentioned the notion of creating a collaborative team of researchers and a pedagogical staff and, of course, technical staff.